but I also want to have more children. And I've sort of concluded that I can't justify doing so moving to Colorado. Good afternoon, friends. Colorado is one of the most beautiful places on earth, but it is also exceptionally dangerous. In this video, I'm going to tell you why having kids in Colorado is a very poor idea. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video, and comment on the video to help the channel's growth. Now let's get started. Now let's first introduce Colorado for those people that don't know much about it. Colorado was a state that was introduced to the Union in the late 1800s. And for those that don't know, after the American Civil War, a lot of these southern gentry began to move westward in the United States, having uh, lost their traditional economic occupation. And these are some of the people People that uh, moved to Colorado, moved to Texas, and so on. So Colorado is actually located sort of central in the United States, but it has a culture that is similar to New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, the southwestern states. In fact, the cowboy hat was first created supposedly in Colorado. Now Colorado is consistently ranked as one of the healthiest states in the United States, and the reason is because its population is very outdoorsy and health conscious culturally. But many people don't realize that Colorado's altitude also affects its health. In particular, Colorado has the highest mean altitude of any state in the United States of America, which is one of the reasons its uh, ski resorts like uh, Vail and Aspen are so popular. But this also affects the health of Coloradoans. Now for reference, Vail and Aspen are about 2.5 kilometers, that's 2,500 meters above sea level, while Boulder and Denver, I was born in Boulder by the way, are about 1,500 meters, 1 1.5 kilometers above sea level. Now you may be surprised to know that these altitude levels really impact the health of residents of Colorado. For example, in the 80s, elderly residents of more higher latitude areas in Colorado were already moving away from those areas because of the health risks they imposed. Diseases that often take the elderly from us, like emphysema, are much more fatal in higher altitudes in Colorado. But the effects on the elderly are not what we're really concerned about here. Instead, it's the effects on families, the effects on pregnant mothers and children that grow up in high altitudes like in Colorado. In the 1950s, when systematic research into the effects of high altitude living on health were first initiated, Colorado became known as the place with the most prematurity of births. At that time in the 1950s, prematurity of birth included being born small. It was a catch-all term. In fact, it wasn't until 1975 that the World Health Organization distinguished between fetal growth restriction and preterm deliveries. Fetal growth restriction means irrespective of the time or the number of months that the mother was pregnant, the baby was born small. In fact, it was the studies in Colorado that first showed the world that growth restriction of the fetus affected birth weight independent of the gestation time period. Gestation means how long the pregnancy was. So that even in not preterm pregnancies, normal pregnancies, restriction of growth of the fetus caused smaller birth weights of the children. In 1982, it was first discovered that in Colorado, pregnant mothers had higher blood pressures and they were much more likely to develop what's called preeclampsia, which is a kind of hypertension that happens during pregnancy. Normally during pregnancy, blood pressure actually drops in the initial phases. This doesn't happen with people living at high altitudes like in Colorado. It, this drop does not occur even if the pregnant mothers never develop hypertension. They don't have that drop. And it was in 1988 that it was first shown that the smaller birth weights of Colorado's babies contributed directly to infant mortality in Colorado. In Colorado, a baby's ability to survive increases as its weight increases up to about 5.5 pounds where it stabilizes. And it's the babies that weigh around one and a half pounds that most contribute to the infant mortality in Colorado. They contribute about 50% to it, these very small babies. Surprisingly, as infant mortality improved across the United States, in the 90s, it actually slightly worsened in Colorado. But survival isn't all that matters. Birth weight is continuously, inversely associated with diabetes incidence later in life, hypertension later in life, obesity later in life, as well as heart disease incidence later in life. That means the bigger you are born, the less likelihood you have to develop what's essentially called metabolic syndrome or heart disease later in life. And this is continuously shown so that it still improves above 5.5 pounds. But what's worse also is that in Colorado, babies are not just born small, but they have a much higher rate of congenital abnormalities. Now in Colorado, babies' birth weights decrease by about 100 grams per thousand meters or kilometer of elevation. 
such that in, even in Colorado, higher altitude places produce smaller babies than lower altitude places. In fact, lower birth weights have a 54% incidence in the higher altitudes of Colorado as opposed to the lower altitudes of Colorado. So even within Colorado, there's quite a bit of divergence and there's a consistent effect such that the higher altitude, the worse the effects on the baby are. Now, how is this all happening? I don't want to get into too much of the detailed mechanisms here, but I want to point out that preeclampsia, that kind of uh, high blood pressure, hypertension that pregnant mothers sometimes have, that causes only about 50% of the babies to be low birth weight. Although Colorado and mothers are three times more likely to develop preeclampsia, that isn't enough to explain their smaller birth weight children. Instead, it's likely something to do with the hypoxia, low levels of oxygen that reach the baby, due to, in particular, a change in the vascularization, that means blood vessel development, in order to redirect blood flow to the uterus. This, or the normal remodeling of vascular tissue, that means uh, blood vessel tissue, doesn't happen as well in high altitude pregnant mothers as it does in pregnant mothers that are at sea level. Now, Colorado is consistently better than the national average in terms of preterm deliveries. Why does that matter? Because preterm deliveries are also something that usually occurs with unhealthy pregnancies. That means that Colorado is doing its best to manage the healthcare system of the pregnant mothers and so on. But it's consistently above the national average in terms of the low birth weights of children. So they're not born much earlier than other states, but they're still born smaller. In fact, although Colorado has better preterm delivery than other states in the United States, even the preterm deliveries have gotten worse in, in recent years. Now in 2019, uh, some researchers sought to determine whether babies are still born small in Colorado because there hadn't been new research on the subject in the last two decades. It turns out they still are. These authors found that only a pregnant mother's hypertension, like proper hypertension, preeclampsia, or smoking could lower birth weights more than Colorado's elevation. That's how uh, potent Colorado's elevation was on the birth weights of children. Generally, children born in Colorado have about a 30% greater likelihood to be born small. And that's not all that's concerning about having a child in Colorado. There's other reasons for congenital defects. For example, they're drilling for natural gas reserves in Colorado. The closer you are to these natural gas reserves, the more likelihood you have to birth a child with congenital defects. Also, the rate of congenital defects has escalated dramatically since the legalization of marijuana in Colorado, something that many people don't know. So is being born at a high altitude always bad? It isn't. Well, not necessarily at least. There are some people, genetic mutants, that have adapted to high altitude living, that can have children at high altitudes that are not born small. Specifically, both the Andeans and the Tibetans do not experience this restriction of intrauterine growth that other people do. And in particular, they develop better blood supply to the uterus, the opposite of what happens to people with European descent that live at high altitudes. Now, to be clear, the people that don't experience this growth reduction of their children are the people who have had several generations living at high altitudes for quite some time. The people that don't have that ancestry but still live in a similar area experience the same problems as residents of Colorado. For example, in Bolivia, the people who don't have those Andean high altitude genetics experience these same problems. Problems. Interestingly, if you have a father with those genetics, you're much more likely to grow to a good size as opposed to a mother. And it seems to be because the father's transmitted genes encourage growth of the fetus, while the mother's transmitted genes restrict growth of the fetus, such that if you have these high altitude genes in the father's side, it's better for the child. Anyway, friends, I hope this video was interesting for you. The research that I made for this video really impacted my own personal decisions, as I was born myself in Boulder, Colorado, and I've been planning to move back to Colorado for some time. But I also want to have more children, and I've sort of concluded that I can't justify doing so um, moving to Colorado now because I would knowingly cause ill health to my children. Hopefully this could also protect some of your friends or relatives. If you know people that are thinking of moving to Colorado, send them this video so they know what they're getting themselves into. By the way, all these health effects are a bit less significant for people in normal age. They generally affect children, babies the worst, but children also and the elderly. Anyway, in future videos, I'm going to introduce you to more discussions on this subject, whether high altitude living can actually be protective for certain diseases. And who are these genetic mutants, the Ethiopians, Tibetans, and Andeans, who survive perfectly fine at high altitudes? Why do they survive perfectly fine? We'll find out soon. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning for more discussion on vitamin D.